continue on that wave and add a bit more. And I'm very happy that a lot of the things that were mentioned uh, are hopefully precisely what we're trying to target with all the materials that we're creating uh, under upscales. Uh, you see on the screen a brief outline of how this session will look. So we're going to start with um, a small overview, uh, again, of the learning content blocks. So what we're producing under upscales is some learning content blocks, which are modular between themselves and within each block, and also these various guidelines. Uh, and uh, right after this, we're going to do a small poll. So while I just go over this briefly, you can open menti.com or prepare your phones to scan a QR code. So you can prepare for that while I show you again the screen of the topics that we're covering and also tell you a few words about who these materials are intended to. So they're intended to be used by uh, teachers and trainers primarily, which means that they have some guides on how they use them, but they also have materials that the students can use directly. So materials that the instructors can give to the students. They're not designed for self-study, so they're primarily made to be used by students. Of course, more advanced students who know how to use a couple of MOOCs and who can find their way around, they can probably benefit from that, but the materials aren't designed primarily for self-study. They're made to be used by teachers and in a modular way. But let's first see how you teach. Uh, I will copy in the chat also uh, the code for the mentee and then the um, link for the survey as well. So if you could let us know, so for those of you who teach, which fields do you teach in? That's the first question. Just write it in as a word. Um, which fields do you teach in? Uh, and just to get an overview of that, because when people registered for this event, we had an idea of which institutions you work at, but not necessarily which field you teach in. Uh, and then once you answer that, you can go to the next question. And the next question is that when you teach, when you create learning materials, do you more create materials from scratch or do you use existing materials created by others? And that's divided into several sections. So you have reading materials, practical exercises, and tests. So there are two questions on the mentee. I'll leave the QR code for maybe half a minute more and then I'll open the results to see what we have. Or applause in the other room for, <laughs> for a brilliant survey, yes, <laughs> and for your answers. Um, okay, some results are coming in already. Let's take a look. Okay, so we have translation, translation, lots of translation, translation technology, linguistics, applied linguistics, morphic syntax. Perfect. So, yeah, these are all topics that are perfectly suited for the use of our materials and for your feedback, uh, because that's what we hope to get your help uh, on in the next phase of the Access project. And then if we look at the second question, yes, precisely. Um, oh, interesting, actually. No, not precisely. This is contrary to what I expected. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so when you prepare learning materials, you uh, mostly, so for reading materials, you rely on available materials and, uh, yeah, for practical exercises and tests, actually, um, you create materials from scratch. Okay, yeah, that's, that's uh, kind of, yeah, actually what, what we did think. Uh, so that's what teachers usually do. That's also in line with my experience as well. So for the reading materials, you rely on the books and the papers available, but then for all the other things, you need to uh, invent them, and that takes a lot of time. So we hope that we can um, we can help you with that the materials we are creating. Um, okay, let me get back to the presentation. Can someone help me with that? Do you, uh, I'm not a Mac user. So, yeah, is it in Safari? Yes, Safari. But it's not. Right. <laughs> Okay. Um, 
so what do we hope to get you to do after this multiplier event? We hope to get you to pilot some of our skills materials. We really appreciate the feedback. We hope it will also make your life easier. Uh, but we also want to help uh, other um, teachers and trainers beyond this event as well. So we really appreciate if you would help us with that. Uh, you could pilot entire learning blocks or individual parts. So you could take a lesson or an exercise or a test or a research project that the ones Michael mentioned. You could take part of the guidelines, like whatever you need just to use it. And then what you will get is full access to our learning content, even before Estab was mentioned. It, it will start becoming available in the coming months. Uh, but you will get uh, even the draft versions because the, these are also useful to be piloted and then we can adjust them for the final draft. And if needed, you'll get advice on how to adapt to your specific needs so the learning content creators can work with you and help you and we'll discuss it a bit today hopefully we'll have some time if you have any specific questions and ideas but we can also have our learning content creators advise you directly on how to use it uh, and what we need from you for the after that is just a feedback form that we will have for you and that's pretty much it so just as today we will going to do a straight feedback so we hope you can do that um, as well so we'll have a sign up form after this event and we hope you will um, fill in the sign up form and distribute it to your colleagues uh, who you uh, uh, might uh, think would also benefit from our materials okay from the introduction to the <laughs> materials so i'm going to start with the first learning block um, this is a sort of a snapshot of our Moodle. It's all on a Moodle that uh, we will open up. And uh, I will briefly present the first steps into scientific research block. Uh, and the total is three CTS. Uh, and then that means that several parts, of course, uh, can be taken. You don't have to take the full block, but this is just to get a sense of how big the project is. And you have the um, learning outcomes defined at the beginning of this learning block. Now, a good thing about this specific one is that um, it shows you already something that we tried to do when creating this learning content. So one uh, thing we did in the beginning is that we did an overview of what already exists. So what we're asking you to do, we did as well. <laughs> and sometimes it seems easier to start from scratch, but there's so many people create things from scratch, and it's really a waste not to do that. So what we did is we relied, we relied for example, on this Momentia uh, online course that some of our project participants did in the past, and we used a lot of these very nice, catchy videos that you can use with your students, so they are there already as well. Uh, and then uh, another thing, that was mentioned today, taking bits and pieces, and some of the, I think you just mentioned, you know, what is a hypothesis? And, um, so here you have, on the other hand, created specifically for this Moodle block, these simple definitions with examples that can just be snapped out of the text and put on handout, just refer to our materials, and that's it. And you can use them adapted as this, as uh, our choice of as you want. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also also have practical exercises. Uh, for example, there are for the student projects that um, Mark mentioned, and then there are examples, for example, how to make a research plan. And there are very specific steps, guiding questions that you can ask your students. And again, these can also be adapted. They don't have to be used as is. And then, for example, there are uh, tasks where you can, uh, because it's scientific thinking, so for example, cultural context and how language and uh, linguistics are approached. Uh, differently uh, in different cultures. You have, for example, two, um, two uh, dictionaries and then to compare these and some of the questions and exercises that you can use for your students. Uh, so we tried to, my dad, yeah. <laughs> so we tried to um, benefit from the diverse backgrounds of the instructors in the skills project to give these kinds of examples that you maybe wouldn't think of if uh, you're not in these fields. Um, and that's uh, my block. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Tanya, and I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I Hello. Tanya will share. Hi. Hi. Thanks, uh, Yelena. So now my five minutes. <laughs> I will uh, start with um, uh, actually with the, um, sharing the screen how our Moodle looks like when you when you uh, get in, and so here are all the resources. And I'm going to scroll down to the one that uh, I'm going to present, and that's this one. Start, start programming with Python in 10 uh, steps. So, um, yeah, you can see that this is already a draft. Uh, already, it's still a draft. And that, uh, although I'm presenting it, we are three authors. All right. So the whole idea of this um, block of uh, content is that 
we actually uh, facilitate something that is called that I think we call it machine learning, but I think it can be called in human learning as well, supervised learning. So the idea is that students can go through these steps uh, largely on their own. So these are the here you can see the list of the steps but uh, that they need to be supervised by a teacher. So they don't, it's not really a fully uh, self-study. And in that sense, um, uh, we follow the idea of upskills that the materials that we prepare, they are actually for teachers, but of course they're also for students. So the, the whole idea is that we prepare some sort of a, a guide um, leading the students step-by-step uh, step towards um, the basic skills in programming that they need in uh, if they want to have uh, good jobs in the tech industry. So that's the, the whole idea. Now, um, so these are the, the steps. I don't think uh, we should go through all of them. Uh -huh, sorry, I should have taken off the... So like that. <laughs> so this is actually how you look see it when you... When you when you uh, land here, so um, so there are ten steps that are uh, largely simplified intro introduction to programming, and the the main idea is that uh, you know we present uh, the notions and the skills in um, in a, in a, in an order that is specifically tailored for people who who are coming from humanities and especially linguistics, right? So, and um, the approach here uh, is really very important. And because, of course, there are many, many um, introductions to Python, and there are many courses and on online tutorials. It's actually, too, there is actually too much materials uh, for somebody who would like to start. And it's really hard for people to know actually where to start. Uh, that's one problem. And another problem is that uh, you know, linguistic students, they uh, usually uh, have uh, initial enthusiasm. They want to start programming and then they get presented with um, um, obstacles that are unnecessary, which uh, often makes them stop. And what are the unnecessary obstacles? The simple things like um, <laughs> Right, I get the message that my connection is unstable. I hope it's all right. So uh, simple things like um, like if uh, if you give an example for how to write uh, some piece of code, this example will actually contain a notion from mathematics that students of linguistics don't know, and so for them this example is useless. So what we what we try to do is really. Um, tailor everything for uh, for students uh, of language and linguistics. So now um, I'm going to go just show one of the items, um, an example, and I picked up this one, which is actually the hardest one. Uh, so what each step consists of, it's uh, so the, in the beginning, we first explain, um, you know, why we are at this step and what is actually the whole point of going through this step. So while uh, while guiding uh, students uh, through, um, through the content, uh, we are actually trying to also encourage them and uh, remove all the unnecessary stress and unnecessary burden to keep only and strictly the necessary one to, through which they really have to go. And so uh, here, um, what we are trying is really to have a very, very digest uh, set of statements that, uh, that are the result of this step. So these are not explanations in this case. So these are really just ready-made statements. Now, um, in the second part, uh, which is called Learn Actively, and which is the, the specifically uh, tailored for the upskills program. So we actually propose activities that will guide students towards their own understanding and confident understanding of all these statements here. So that will guide them through towards good use of the terminology and uh, actually will help them um, with some often trivial things that are rarely explained. So that is actually the, 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 uh, the whole idea. And um, so here we have a strict selection of resources to be used for this. So this is what we uh, try to contribute uh, with this project so that students, they don't have to go through 500 
courses like I used to at the time when I tried to, to start. But they know that they go directly where they need to go and read exactly what they need to read in order to acquire this skill quickly. Right. Um, and so the activities are different. So there are some that are more active. Then there is something that is about reading. So they can go and then find some uh, examples. For example, I have to just go here. Yeah, and then come back. Um, oops, that's uh, <laughs> not so easy. And then, um, so we prepare also problems. Uh, and so here is, and this is a special encouragement <laughs> that is based on a popular meme, um, Drake approves. Um, and so the, this is the part where the teacher comes in. So the solution to these problems are sent only to teachers so that um, students can do the task and then they get the feedback uh, from the teacher. So to wrap up, the whole idea is that uh, students, they go through these activities, do the exercises, and then they get... Uh, some some feedback from the teacher. And this is the main role of the teacher here. Um, and so we hope that in this way, we can uh, facilitate teaching programming for linguists uh, by people who are maybe not linguists, because that's, that's often the case. Thanks, I think that's uh, all that I uh, had. Yeah, perfect, perfect and perfect timing. Thank you, you were a tiny bit catchy. But we got everything, so thanks so much. Uh, we're gonna proceed with uh, Navella Tedesco, and uh, she's gonna present the text processing uh, content. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen. Actually, I'm gonna share a presentation. So, um, can you see it also this way? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So uh, I'm going to do a short presentation of the course text processing that was developed by me, Silvia Bernardini and uh, Adriano Ferraresi at the University of Bologna. And the course is designed to be used by teachers in a BA course, although uh, exploiting these materials for self-learning is possible. Uh, as Yelena was mentioning. Um, so unlike Tanya, I have some uh, uh, screenshots. I think it's going to work anyways. And uh, uh, for the development of the content in some of the units, we have adapted and transformed the pre-existing materials available in the digiting uh, course. And this is signaled uh, with the black asterisk. Um, However, those materials were a little interactive and very advanced for BA students, so we made many changes. Uh, the course puts together basic notions and techniques of uh, text processing uh, with the skills related to corpus linguistics, such as corporal creation and management and the ability to use corpus query tools for simple or advanced queries. The stru structure of the course was developed uh, according to the app skills uh, needs analysis. For this reason, besides the technical and theoretical skills, uh, the aim of the course is also for students uh, to develop research skills as well as organizational and interactional skills, all these being of primary importance for the new generation of uh, linguist specialists. Uh, and this is well not noticeable in the structure of the course. From the first unit, practical case studies are presented to the students. After a few introductory slides, the, um, for example, in the first unit, we exploit the emolument closes case. That was a, a thing back in uh, 2018. I don't know if you remember it, uh, involving the former US President Trump. And it is brought up as an example of a mass media case where corpus linguistics contributions were essential for the resolution of the case. We try to maintain this practical and research-based approach throughout the course, linking theoretical and technical skills to real-life working situations. And indeed, the last two units of the course are specifically focused on research questions involving being corpus-based methods and text processing, up to the point where students are asked in the end to produce their own research output. So uh, to make all of this possible, we have exploited many learning content types provided by Moodle and the Moodle plugin H5P, 
such as forums, interactive presentations, uh, question chats, and so on. Uh, the course features final tests for each unit that are automatically scored and can optionally be used by teachers for grading students or just as a review. For most of the tests and the activities included in the course, um, they are presented in form of games. For example, we use the crosswords uh, and the students often can get awards. And uh, we have also developed some guidelines for teachers where we suggest in class gamification options for most units. So I thought to show you uh, all of this uh, in action. Um, with uh, some uh, sc video screenshots of me navigating the, um, um, the, the course. Uh, this slide features the screen recording of the um, first unit, the one I was uh, telling you about earlier. Uh, here you can see that learning content uh, is linked, uh, is put together with reviewing activities, uh, with uh, open questions uh, and with uh, other communicative interactions. Uh, and this presentation was uh, developed uh, using uh, H5P uh, also. And uh, I will go a little bit faster. This is uh, the final one of the final tests for the unit two. And uh, uh, the, the unit two is called uh, uh, basics of text processing. It includes some basic notions of text processing, such as regular expressions. And depending on the teaching context, uh, uh, this activity can be used, as I was saying, to evaluate students or just as a review or also as a part of it, the gamified version of the course. And because this presentation, uh, the presentations in, in this unit are already very interactive, in the final test we wanted to include only the key topics of the unit, leaving the rest for the discussion in class or discussion through the forum space, which I'm going to show you uh, later. And um, this instead is uh, our, our final unit, our unit seven looks uh, like. Uh, we have uh, adapted uh, one of the two research projects uh, uh, that we did uh, together with uh, Juliana uh, that I shortly presented this morning. Um, uh, because uh, we thought it is uh, um, it it, uh, it is good. It is essential, actually, to um, put uh, uh, together at least one student project with the course, so that students can truly develop the technical and practical skills that are required um, in the course, and that they might not develop completely through the course only. Uh, in this adaptation of the project, we have included examples, templates, instructions to guide the students through the production of the final deliverable. And we have defined the feedback points. And this that you're seeing is the final checklist that we inserted in the hand-in link. This is what I wanted uh, to show you in the end. That is the forum uh, space that we created. It's called the Full for Talk and it's present in each uh, unit. So this one is for unit six. Uh, that is a unit where we uh, simply uh, show students three different uh, research uh, papers where um, corpus linguistics was used to solve uh, and text processing were used to solve uh, different tasks related to linguistics. And um, uh, uh, more types of uh, innovative learning contents are present in the course, which I cannot uh, show now for time-related issues, but uh, I hope this presentation was uh, enough to give you an idea of all the potentials of the course uh, that we tried to develop and also the work that was uh, behind it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nivella. Uh, that was great. And uh, also, I'd like to highlight these automatically graded tests. So when I convinced colleagues at my institution to use Moodle, that was one of the highlights. But I told them tests can be graded automatically. They love that, especially for big classes. So that's a great selling point. And all of these Moodle activities can be exported. So if you're 
institution uses Moodle, you can just export them from our new courses and then introduce them into your own Moodle infrastructure. Um, okay, thank you so much, Anela. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, Lewis, talking about speech recognition and course alignment. So uh, <coughs> the course is about uh, speech recognition and course alignment. Uh, that was divided into, because it's a very technical and broad area, we divided it into, into 10 uh, subsections. Uh, it totals 60 C. Yeah. And uh, uh, what I actually wanted to show was uh, how we divided uh, the whole topic into six, into ten uh, subtopics. So per uh, topic, uh, we first uh, explain the main things that should be known by the students. So that is uh, to uh, to uh, to simplify the link between the technical area and the on the one hand, and the linguistic background of the student view, on the other hand, and uh, maybe I can show later. Uh, we'll <coughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so, uh, the most important things are what are the concepts, what should the student know. Uh, so we don't go into the technical details in the entire course, but we uh, we only mention the the, con the relevant concepts. And all the videos that are on the web. So we present uh, to uh, one handbook, and all the relevant informa <coughs> information is in PDFs on the web. And the course is basically a, 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 a sort of roadmap <coughs> that is uh, an introduction to all the information that is available on the web. There are two reasons for this. So I was going here on my computer. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. So, for example, uh, so for example, um, this. It's so sweet. Oh yeah. So, uh, as a start. Uh, we first uh, mentioned what is relevant uh, 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 at the beginning of the course. So uh, the course aims to make a bridge between the students with the linguistic backgrounds and ASR as a technical topic. And in, in order to familiarize yourself, you need to know about the terms, about the concepts. So not in the technical details, but the names of the technical terms like for, for example, what is alignment, what is matching, what are, how you define words or arrays, all these things. So uh, there, are, uh, there are basically, uh, there is one textbook which is given here, which is a very famous textbook, which is the classic on ASR, and that is given information about the uh, the way people did it until five years ago, so it is uh, the modular approach. Uh, nowadays, ASR is confronted with the AI storm, so uh, 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 this is about end-to-end. -end. So it is a totally different approach, so the course is trying to familiarize the students with both approaches, uh, the, the classical approach because that gives the, the, the playground for linking your knowledge with the technology and the end-to-end -end approach because that is the state of the art right now. So in order to, to link these two, uh, the course is uh, uh, positioned in a sort of uh, showing the way how you navigate yourself through all the information on the web. So for example, uh, this is about this is about uh, the entire course. I will show you uh, in a minute. This is the handbook. Uh, and these are two backgrounds, how the course is embedded into RBT. And uh, what you uh, have as background, uh, the background, uh, learning outcomes, goals, and learning activities. And just to show the entire content of the course, it is uh, organized uh, according to topics, as I said. So this is the introduction, 
And uh, the Moodle is organized along these, these topics. So this is all about the uh, handbook and so on, the relevant chapters, uh, the reading activities that you are, uh, that the students are uh, confronted with, the global, global course overview. And here you see uh, per topic what is relevant and what, uh, what is material for, for problem solving. So that goes on and on. And so the Moodle it itself is, uh, uh, is uh, organized according to these topics. So first of all, take architecture uh, version two. So this topic is about the more recent approach in ASR and to end modeling. So uh, uh, there the uh, student is informed about the, the display, the uh, deep learning mod models, uh, what, how you train them, what is essential in the data, uh, what do you, what, how the model is learning, what do we learn from the deep learning, and all these more difficult questions. But nowhere the course is, taken, is going into the more technical details because that goes too far. And it takes way too much time. And so you can devote entire PhDs projects on single topics in ASR. So that's what that's also no go. Let me see. So for example, uh, so for example, uh, topic number one is about the speech signal itself. So there the, the student is uh, Ask to open perhaps as in the, the waveform editor to speak something, a specific word, and to explain what the, what is uh, to be seen in the, in, the, in, the, in the signal. That is the very start. Then we talk about acoustic features in topic number two. Uh, acoustic features are the very first things that we need to extract from the waveform in order to do anything else. Then base and theory, that is maybe the most technical. It is about the basic concepts that you need to understand how an ASR is looking for the words given the audio. And then you have different architectures in topic four and five. Uh, topic number six is force alignment as a special case of uh, speech recognition. Uh, topic number six is very relevant because many, many uh, approaches in both in audio corpora are based on for force alignments. And if you want to align your text to the audio, that's sort of just force alignments. And then topic seven is about data uh, with examples. Topic eight is about dialogue, that meaning dialogue systems, very relevant and uh, machine communication. Then number nine is language models. Interesting for those who are in, into languages and text. So the link between LNs and ASR is topic number nine. And it's topic number 10, finally, is about the thesis. <coughs> the proposal is giving 10 different options for possible topics to address by, uh, in a thesis for, for 3DC. Uh, how that can be implemented is basically depending on the institution and the teachers and whatever your the curriculum. But we gave examples, and then uh, the, the students can choose. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no worries. Great. And thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, this is this is great. And you might have noticed by now that we keep switching between course and block. So that's something that we struggled a lot within the project as well, how to think of these areas that we're dealing with. And we thought of them as courses in order to give them ECTS and learning outcomes. But then afterwards, you could just dismantle them. So there are courses, but there are two blocks of materials as well. Uh, courses in the inception moment, but then any kind of topic you realize. And we'd love to have a searchable, as some of you mentioned, like something where you can have all of these things and then you can just search keywords and see whether the uh, elements you can pick and choose. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, um, Louis. And then we're going on to introduction to language variation. And I see Margarita Palatina. Hello. So. <clears throat> Uh, our block, Introduction to Language Variation, is uh, based on the idea that came already in the up in the discussion in the previous session, uh, namely what happens if your institution has a rigid curricula which can hardly be changed from one year to the other, but you still find the upskills proposal interesting. I think it was best now who pretty much raised this question earlier on. Um, so. 
we should think of it as the fact that AppScale is not just a repository of content blocks, but it's also an approach to teaching which aims at promoting the development of additional skills in an interactive class environment, where addition, additional refers to the fact that an instructor must not replace the disciplinary content, for instance, theoretical linguistics in our case, with practical notions, but the two aspects should be integrated at the same time. So in this course, what we propose is that we are going to keep a core of theoretical notions, as for instance, teaching the ideas, the concept of language variation and the basic principles of generative grammar. But in addition to that, at the end, uh, at the completion of the block of or of the, mo of the uh, topics, the students will also be able to perform certain tasks, as for instance, collect linguistic data, organize and annotate the data, confront the data with a theory, analyze it, compare analysis and theor or theoretical approaches, interact minimally with programming, and elaborate, finally, a report of their research activity. And all of this, it is supported by a game which we created, in fact, for uh, the purpose of this course. Um, the course is uh, shaped in the way that you could see on screen now. There is a first style which explains how the modules can be combined. So the modules, sorry, I mean the different topics. There are four core topics which uh, um, focus on different aspects. One introductory, introductory topic, topic one, and three topics that focus on more specific domain. While the introductory topic is general and can be com combined with any other module, and should be combined with any other topic. The other topics are independent from one another, so they can be taken or taught as independent units. Each topic has classes within it, and the classes are always organized in a way that there is an outline for the class, what you can see on the lower tile on the left, so topic one, task class one, for instance, and some quizzes, which will allow the students to revise the uh, concepts that they saw in class. Each class has the same structure. There is a listing of learning outcomes. For instance, in topic one, class one would be learn to provide examples or non-binary, binary linguistic features also called, referred to as attributes in the course. And then there is a definition of the layout because remember that these classes are intended to be, these are notes for instructors who want to teach or use this to teach their own cl in, uh, class, in which there is an explanation of how the time in class will be organized and with the idea that uh, a class is based uh, is, will last 130 minutes. Then there is uh, an explanation, a presentation of the learning material, something very traditional, like a, re a reading, like Radford in this case, or some material that we expressly prepared for this class, as for instance, the manual of instruction of the game Guest the Language, that is the game that we created. On top of that, in the le learning materials, there is also the game itself, which, as we will see in the next slide, is a re-edition based on languages on the popular game Guess Who. Then, in each class, there are class activities, so hands-on activities in which the students, under the guide of the uh, instructor, will be able to learn something about the outcomes of that class. So, for instance, um, and there, uh, in each uh, activity, there will be the material needed for that activity listed, the goal of the activity, how to carry out that activity, and the estimated time that an instructor should devote to that specific activity. There is an outline of the debrief and an introduction. In this case, will be an introduction to generative grammar for the class one of the first topic. And then finally, the homework, the assessment, and again, coming back to a topic that was discussed earlier today, a detailed workload, both for the teacher and for the students, in case someone decides to, in fact, adopt this class. So they can estimate ahead of time what, how much it will take them to implement this specific class. 
Uh, as for the game, the game, we're really proud of it. <laughs> uh, you might remember the game uh, Guess Who? It exists since the 70s. It's a guessing game in which you need to guess the physical features of a person, like Alfred, for instance, blue eyes, long hair, red hair, mustaches, etc. Or Maria, green hat, earrings, uh, long brown hair, etc. But instead of using uh, facial features, we do use language features, both uh, as lexical or morphosyntact, intended as lexical features or morphosyntactic features. And also, uh, we uh, replace Alfred, Maria, and the other characters with languages, for instance, Russian, Spanish, Swahili, Turkish, Yoruba. And uh, there are also uh, a set of uh, questions that, the, the, that the, the, the player can ask the computer. And then there are uh, controls to respond to the computer's uh, questions. At this stage, you can only play against the computer, not against another player. Maybe we will implement it at, at, at some point. And out of these games, there are a number of activities that we developed in the class that can be performed in class. And the acti these activities are of a different kind. So for instance, you can use the game as set ready to break the ice in class, to teach how to interact with the JavaScript file, to teach different data collection techniques, to teach what language diversity comes down to be like, teach how, organizing uh, how to organize data in a meaningful way. And uh, all of these activities are listed in the, um, in, in, in the course of the different uh, topics. Uh, mostly, most, act most topics, most classes have an activity that is related to this game. And uh, um, each of them will target a specific learning um, outcome that is listed at the beginning of the module. And so uh, hoping to also surprise uh, my colleagues from Upskills, we finally have the final version of the game, which uh, David, would you please my, uh, upload the link on the chat so that everyone can download it? You will find it in the uh, game pack zip folder that uh, is uh, accessible from the link posted in the chat. It's enough to unzip the folder and click on the HTML file named index.html, and you can start playing. So thank you, and have fun playing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margarita. Thank you for this lovely gift. Uh, I can tell you you had some hearts and smiles on the Zoom and lots of smiles here in the room as well. So I think you're proud of a good reason. This is really uh, lots of fun. Perfect. Uh, well, following this, we have now uh, Deepana, who is going to present the collected data from human subjects. Um, okay, so um, here's here's some basic information about uh, our learning uh, content unit block, um, the name of which is collecting data from human participants. Um, this unit block contains um, six ECTS uh, points, and uh, it is designed by myself and my colleague Martina Podboy from University of Rijeka, as well as by Marko Simonovic from the University of uh, Graz. Uh, thematically, the unit block is structured in four parts. Um, the general part, the part devoted to morphology and morphosyntax, the part dedicated to a second language acquisition, and the part dealing with sociolinguistics. In addition to these four, uh, main, four main parts, it also contains uh, two student projects, each of which <coughs> is uh, supposed to um, um, contain uh, three ECTS um, points, and uh, one which is devoted to uh, morphology and morphosyntax, and the other to social uh, and the other to second language acquisition. Um, here is a list. Here is an overview of the topics covered in each of the four main parts of the unit, and these topics actually function as subunits within uh, the unit block. The general part contains um, relevant terms and distinctions um, in relation to collecting data from human participants, ethics in linguistic research with human participants, and population sampling in linguistic research. The part devoted to morphology and morphosyntax contains yeah, subunits 
uh, tackling judgment data, judgment tasks, creating an experiment or survey, and data elicitation. The part devoted to second language acquisition is composed of um, the subunits dealing with comprehension tasks in SLA, elicited production tasks in SLA, and acceptability judgment tasks in SLA. And the last but not least part devoted to sociolinguistics contains subunits tackling ethnographic fieldwork in sociolinguistics, the sociolinguistic interview, and surveys and questionnaires in sociolinguistic research. The two student projects um, deal with irregular phonological alternations and with second language acquisition of English morphosyntax. Here is an overview of the general uh, subunit structure. So this is as much as we can generalize when it comes to the structure of this unit. Um, each subunit starts with some kind of preparatory reading assignment typically follow up by in-class um, discussion um, based on the reading that has been done uh, at home, or a warm-up activity in class, um, such as a brainstorming session based on some kind of a prompt provided in class. Then it's followed by uh, a PowerPoint presentation with notes for teachers, accompanied by handouts for students. So this is something that uh, teachers can, can use um, in class, and to give to their students uh, after class. Um, after the, pres the PowerPoint presentation, uh, we typically have a reading assignment, but not in all cases if a reading has assignment has been given to students um, as, as, preparatory, as a preparatory task. Uh, all subunits contain a practical assignment, which is some kind of hands-on research activity which they have to um, carry out based on all the input they have received so far and all the uh, knowledge and uh, experience that they have gained with the topic. And all subunits also end uh, with a quiz which contains um, 10 multiple choice questions. Um, given that the topic of this um, multiplayer event is um, research-based teaching, I have decided to um, illustrate one, um, one piece of material <laughs> that we developed within the project, which is an example of a student project, more specifically um, a project entitled uh, Second Language Acquisition of English Mongol Syntax and Experimental Study. Um, this student uh, project has been uh, based or produced in line with the guidelines for the students' projects and research reporting formats that we have developed within uh, the UpSkills project. So uh, all the student projects that will be part of um, the learning uh, content um, output will more or less uh, have the same uh, structure. Um, the, the project is uh, dedicated to exploring the second language acquisition of one aspect of English morphosyntax experimentally. The students have to choose a morphosyntactic phenomenon in English that they're uh, roughly familiar with and a factor or factors that might affect the acquisition of this phenomenon and design and implement a small-scale experimental study with elder learners and native speakers as, as, as participants to explore the effects of this factor or these factors on the process and or outcome of acquiring this phenomenon in the L2 and produce a research report in the end. Um, the format of the deliverable is the research report and this project is supposed to uh, bring three ECTS points to students. Uh, it can be carried out by students at the BA and MA level um, the time commitment is roughly 75 hours, which corresponds to three ECTS points. Um, the time commitment on the part of the teacher uh, is expected to be about 10 hours. Uh, students um, have uh, three feedback, feedback points, uh, or three points in the process of carrying out this project at, at which they receive feedback. One is after uh, the first presentation which they give in class, the second after the second presentation, and the third after they produce uh, the research report. Um, it is um, 
advisable that the students are familiar with basic concepts, theoretical issues, and empirical findings in second language acquisition before attempting to carry out this task. And um, the rest of the project uh, distinct, uh, description um, on, the, on the Moodle platform, which, should be, uh, which should, uh, we have uploaded um, already, contains a list of the learning uh, outcomes um, pertaining to this project, uh, detailed instructions for students uh, when it comes to uh, the steps, steps that they need to take in carrying out this project, as well as detailed instructions uh, on how to produce a research report. It contains a list of criteria that uh, the teacher will use to assess the project, and also a list of sources that the students are advised to use in the process of carrying out the project. Uh, there's a lot of, so there are two more presentations, and that's not all we prepared, but that's all we're going to present today. We're going to go maybe 10 minutes over time in this session, but we're going to wrap up uh, then a bit quicker. Uh, so I will now give the floor to Maya. Uh, Maya Dimitri Spetovic, she's going to present language data science. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm representing our, our little group who is working on um, a blog on the blog dedicated to language data science. What we are specifically focusing on uh, within the broader field of language data science is statistical analysis. So it is, we do con try to connect our content to machine learning as well, but we are primarily dealing with statistical analysis. And uh, our situation uh, was and is uh, quite similar to what Tanya described for programming. Um, there is uh, a lot of content already available. So the list of existing materials is practically endless, but very often they are not very friendly materials for students of languages and linguistics who sometimes, if not often, go into languages to get away from maths. And then they get really scared when the first examples they see are filled with uh, um, assumptions about previous knowledge of math. So even though our uh, the content that we are presenting is quite standard for statistical courses. So we start with some foundations. Uh, so Statistics 101 and R is our software of choice. So we present um, some key notions about how R works, how to install it, and so on. Uh, then we have two units dedicated to descriptive statistics, so calculating means, standard deviations, showing data on graphs. Uh, and then we have two units dedicated to inferential statistics, so the logic behind tests and uh, a couple of simple tests. So that's quite, quite standard. But what we actually try to do within that uh, is to not focus so much on maths, uh, to keep the math simple, but to really insist on explaining well uh, the research design part, because uh, that is what can get uh, people in trouble if they don't get it right. Uh, the maths is usually easier to solve later on. So we actually dedicate a lot of attention to explaining uh, the core concepts relating them to the general uh, knowledge about, well, how research methodology works. So within uh, most of our units, we have a block dedicated to key concepts, then a block dedicated to activities that often include data and code because we also have practical, uh, practical exercises. So activities include... Um, Again, something similar to what Tanya has showed. We point to uh, what we have chosen as good resources to read or view that already exist. Uh, and then we also add some exercises. Now for the part that is more theoretical and methodological, uh, we have decided to use Moodle books because they are a very convenient format for presenting different kinds of content. And then they can be downloaded as uh, single files and bits and pieces can be taken taken from them. So here you see the example from our first unit. So you can actually see, I hope you can read this, uh, that 
we actually discuss, uh, we dedicate a lot of time to key notions like variables, population, samples, and, and so on. Uh, and it is possible then to reuse, use and reuse these materials by taking single chunks or entire uh, book chapters or even entire units. And then for exercises, we have data and code. We also have um, ARC markdown files uh, to, um, to also add more, uh, more text. Uh, so our materials are and will be fully downloadable, modifiable, and we try to make them really modular. So it is possible to take them and use them as a full course. Uh, you can take, ex you can extract course units, uh, single books or book chapters, or even individual paragraphs. Uh, and the same goes for exercises. And we think that uh, these materials can be used not only for courses that are specifically dedicated to statistics, but within any course that has a data analysis component in it. So research-based teaching often does have an, a data analysis component. So we think there is possibly a very wide uh, potential use for, for, these, for these materials. Okay, and I think that I will stop here. So I'm uh, let me just, uh, yeah, switch to the presentation. Uh, we're going to end with our hosts here. So back to Claudia. We've heard a bit of it already today, but Juliana will now talk a bit about the um, introduction to language data uh, unit block. Yes, uh, standards and questions. So um, we have developed a uh, four or five PCPS course. Um, since we are not directly teaching at CLAD, we don't have students, we have never piloted this course, so this is the first time um, we have designed, designed such a course. Uh, here you can see an overview of the main uh, learning outcomes, and um, of course the prerequisites uh, would be that the students uh, first follow the introduction to text processing uh, developed by the University of Bologna. So uh, these are the units in a nutshell on Moodle, uh, so introduction to research infrastructure of, infrastructures of language resources and technology, how to find access and use language resources, and how to find tools um, for linguistic processing, annotation and analysis, how to archive and share resources according to uh, data uh, citation principles and um, uh, following standards in the community. And then um, we have developed a student project in collaboration with the um, University of Bologna. And we have also developed a glossary uh, with terminology specific to uh, research infrastructures and repositories. Uh, this is an example of a sign uh, For example, um, you could um, ask the students to search for five Fondra in the cloud resource families on a topic that interests them and then ask them to assess the fairness uh, of these resources by answering uh, this couple of questions. And um, the delivery format of, should be uh, like a report in a blog post format and um, can be uh, evaluated, maybe the, uh, the, it, it can be evaluated by the, by the peers in the classroom. So since I'm not teaching this, um, I've never thought about clarity, it was Quite a challenge to develop uh, learning activities in event, uh, read a lot. Um, so any feedback you have during piloting, I, I've heard from uh, Carola that she is interested in piloting this course in the corpus analysis tools uh, uh, next, next year. Um, I would be very interesting. Uh, it would be very interesting to receive new suggestions for learning activities, of course. Um, and this is the glossary. I've tried to develop a learner's glossary, so also integrating uh, videos, uh, also about data citation uh, data. <laughs> so um, to, to, to make the, the, the glossary a little bit more interactive and uh, so that the students can have fun. And then all these uh, concepts in the glossary, they are automatically highlighted in the Moodle content. So it would be nice for them to navigate the course and also learn and uh, acquire the concepts while they go through the course. Of course, uh, as Yelena said, the course is mainly for teachers, but then some uh, bits and pieces can be followed also independently by the students. That's it. Okay. 
Thank you, thank you so much, Juliana. Uh, and as you can see, we've gone through all these um, unit blocks, but there are more unit blocks, and there are the guidelines as well. And in addition to the guidelines that you've heard about today, we also have some guidelines for creating learning content, which we produce for our partners, but we also make available to others, and also for gamifying. Uh, now, I'll ask you for two more things. One is, uh, well, sort of a, a request. So if you could fill in another mentee, and I'm sending it in the chat as well. So we're going to ask you how likely are you to register for piloting, which is the next step of the optional, and then how likely are you to recommend it to others. Uh, now, as we said, there are these learning blocks that can be fully taken apart, and they're all on Moodle. Uh, there are also these guidelines, which are now in the big blocks of text, and then I think we'll take on um, board some of the feedback we got in today, and maybe have some more templates uh, and more user friendly data. Uh, so, if you could answer uh, this mentee, that would be wonderful. And we can see that, yeah, people cannot wait, not really. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, if nothing, you can be very happy. Uh, that is wonderful. Uh, so I don't have to sell the content again for you. I can just tell you where to go to do that. Uh, and I'll also copy this now in the chat as well. So it is a short Google form indicative of the short feedback form you also need to fill in uh, towards the end. So here you can register your interest. Uh, you have the learning box listed independently. Uh, you can check those that you think uh, may apply. Uh, and you can also register for the different guidelines. And then we will be in touch with you as soon as they become available. Uh, they might not all be available at the same time, but to all those who register, we will the progress in the other fields as well, just uh, so you know we won't spam you, don't worry. <laughs> we'll be getting in touch with you uh, very, very soon. Uh, so we'd like to ask you to register if you like, uh, but of course we'd also like you to share this link with others. We would really appreciate any piloting. The sooner the better, so if it's the spring semester of this school year, that would be best. Uh, so it could be something that's in the first half of, of next year. Uh, if it's throughout next year or even in the next school year, that's also fine. Uh, we plan on adjusting these materials because the idea is to have them live on and be used as much as possible. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go back. I think someone wanted to scan the QR code, so I'll just put it back on the screen and I'll uh, read the status and read that. Obviously, thank you all very much. By way of conclusion, I would like to really and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sincerely thank everyone for the really interesting discussions. I think you've given us a lot to think about. Um, and especially one of the things that we have been considering is how to make all of this uh, more usable and user friendly um, for others. So your um, contribution today has been amazing um uh, in this regard um i i think that you, you know if we are to get a take home message uh from today's uh, multiplier event it's basically that yes indeed research based teaching is something that we need a bit more of but it also comes with a, a whole host of challenges that we need to face um so uh, at least I'm, I'm I'm really happy to to realize that you know what we're doing uh, in upskills is actually something that's worthwhile and potentially um, um, you know interesting for for many outsiders as well. I would like to definitely think um, um, apart, first of all I would like to thank the organizers, would like to Clarin for the immaculate organization of the event. I mean we all know that they're they're really good at this. Um, they they've kept things uh, at the highest bar possible so i'd like to really thank especially uliana um and obviously you know the people david uh, as well uh for for all their uh, hard work behind the scenes uh i would also like to thank uh, all the speakers um and the uh, participants as well um perhaps even more so the participants for uh, giving us all this lovely feedback to look uh, to look at and of course the speakers for their time and their interest in our work um i would like to remind people i mean i think you will receive an email at the end um as well uh so um yeah, I mean, uh, the, please fill in the form for piloting if you're interested in piloting some of the courses, and then we'll get in touch with you with further steps. And uh, uh, when it comes to upcoming events, we don't have something that is really impending right now, um, but um, 
either on February, March. I mean, it, it's not yet fully settled when our fourth multiplier event uh, will be. Uh, this will actually be um, uh, organized in Malta. And uh, uh, it, uh, yeah, proud here too. <laughs> and uh, it will be focusing on the educational games. Uh, so we have a bit of work to do on that front too. Um, but you will be notified as long as you sign up for a newsletter um, or uh, in the evaluation form. Um, uh, you know, you will be notified about it, and it will again be a hybrid event, as far as I, um, uh, as I can tell from now. Thank you.